behind that effort and the strategies employed thus far towards its realization. Like I said, that presentation is going to start promptly at 2 Eastern time. Okay, I got 2 o'clock on my screen over here, so welcome back to the 2017 Cephalin Virtual Conference. I hope everyone's been enjoying their day so far. Again, the theme today is Digital Utopia, Libraries Building Communities of Learning. Our next session features Vika Zafrin, PhD. Vika is Boston University's Digital Scholarship Librarian and a trained digital humanist active in the DH community. Among her fields of expertise are digital collections, open access issues, libraries and IT collaboration in higher education, and digital preservation. A digital humanist by training, she is active in the DH community, serving as the Executive Secretary of the Association for Computers and the Humanities. Zafrin received her PhD in Special Graduate Studies from Brown University in 2007. Please join me in welcoming Vika Zafrin. Vika, are you there? Hello, yes, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Um, let me share my webcam. There you are, now we can see you. All right, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, let's see if I can, yes, great. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation, Cephalin, uh, and in particular, Kelly Rowan, who reached out to me, and Melanie McCartney, who was organizing this thing even with a hurricane looming, and also Alicia, who just uh, reached out, and Jennifer, uh, to set up the tech. So I am really thankful, and uh, I've been really enjoying the day so far, uh, and am uh, very pleased to, to follow Nate's talk on failure, because I'll be talking about um, things that scare us and th a thing that might fail. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that I'm here to talk about a project that I am afraid to tell you about. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, one is that the project is both political in nature and politically motivated, and that's always a vulnerable place to be in. Um, the other, uh, another reason that I'm afraid to tell you about it is because it's it's in its beginning stages. All I've got to offer you is framing. Uh, and this goes against academic culture. Shouldn't this be a lightning talk about a work in progress? Um, but this doesn't fit into a lightning talk because this is a type of work that libraries and archives have historically done poorly and we very much want to do it right. Um, it involves people who are right now in this country being traumatized by both their fellow citizens and by various people in authority. And um, because the project deals with topics that have to do with this trauma. And so um, we want to talk about it so that A, we go slowly and B, we get feedback. Um, the third reason I'm afraid to tell you about it is that, as uh, you have sur surmised by now, it's an activist project. Uh, and talking about activism feels like the worst kind of virtue signaling. You don't talk about the sort of work, you just do it. Here's why I'm talking about it anyway. Uh, because one, uh, maybe some of you are full of fear too. Uh, two, because we may be fumbling, but doing so in company is more productive, I think. Uh, and three, because just for today, this conference about building communities of learning maybe is one. And I hope that um, that we're going to have a conversation about that at the end of the talk. Um, this is fundamentally a talk about struggling in an area that we feel is critically important and needs our work and where we don't feel that we know enough, basically, ever. And by we, I mean my department, Digital Scholarship Services at BU, uh, but maybe also the people who most closely guide our work at my university. Uh, work on the Vulnerable Archives project has been going on for almost a year, and we haven't wasted time, but granted this was in the, within the parameters of a very busy first year of my department's existence. Um, we've been sort of operating in startup mode, and in some ways, I feel like only now we are getting to breathe a little bit and and uh, approach this project in the measured way that I think uh, it needs and deserves. So bear with me uh, with all these disclaimers, and maybe we can ask each other some questions at the end, I hope. 
Um, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give a lot of institutional context, then I'm gonna describe the project, and then I will talk about the larger context, both social and academic, um, bringing in some voices from the fields that are guiding our work. So here's the context. I am not a trained librarian. Uh, I am a trained digital humanist, but I have been working in libraries and specifically various places around BU libraries for almost a decade. Uh, the Department of Digital Scholarship Services is one year old and we've been struggling, I think, productively to define our identity and, and direction. Um, and because we're so new and because I have training that is from outside of the libraries, I feel like we've had a certain freedom to make decisions about not only what we're doing, but how and why. Um, but to manifest those decisions in a meaningful way, we need to integrate the department indispensably into the fabric of both the library organization and the university. And to do that, we need to understand this particular university. So here's a bit of our larger institutional and urban context. For those of you who are not local to me, which I assume is most of you, we are not Boston College, that's a different institution. Uh, we are uh, a research one, a research intensive institution that was founded <clears throat> initially as a Methodist seminary uh, and now is secular, although we do have a school of theology as one of our schools and colleges that, that used to be the core of, of the university. We have un, uh, just under 10,000 uh, faculty and staff combined, uh, just over 33,000 students, and over half of those are undergrads. We have two campuses that are integrated into the city, uh, and BU has very close ties to the city and works with its administration um, I wanted to give you some recent examples just to, uh, again, add to the context. Uh, one was a collaboration uh, BU did with the Boston Women's Workforce Council on a project about the gender pay gap in the area. Uh, that was a computational project that, that um, our Hariri Institute uh, for Computational Thinking did. Um, <clears throat> We have an initiative on cities uh, founded by the late former mayor, Thomas Menino, uh, that, that is within BU, uh, that seeks to, quote, promote and advance the adaptive urban leadership strategies necessary to support cities as dynamic centers of economic growth and development in the 21st century. Um, and so that initiative, of course, has many ties to Boston and also to other uh, urban areas. And finally, the Boston Public Schools and the BU Spark, um, which is a, 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 an outfit uh, led by Ziba Cranmer within BU that uh, seeks to give computer science majors or pro programmers, young programmers, uh, sort of an entrepreneurial project to work on. Um, they have a new project together uh, called More Than a Mile, which is designed to encourage students to use the city of Boston as a classroom. It's an app uh, that will list free and sponsored events from local companies and cultural organizations and other partners. Um, and the, the app is designed to build the real life transcript of Boston public school students. So that's BU and how it interacts with the city, which is relevant to our project. So within the institution of BU, there's the institution of BU libraries. BU libraries, uh, consist of uh, a main library called the Mugar Memorial Library and branches underneath it that are subject specific, plus uh, three libraries that report up to their deans but collaborate closely with uh, Mugar and branches, uh, and those are the law, medical school, and theology libraries. Um, Digital Scholarship Services, or DISC, <coughs> is, at, is at Mugar, and we are serving the entire university. Uh, for most of the last decade, we've been having conversations, reimagining our libraries at the core, as many other libraries have been doing. This is slow work. Uh, like most, we are dealing with decades of underfunding legacy, uh, and this work has also coincided with BU growing with, as an institution in some significant ways. So, so there's, as, as everything, as sort of all of these pieces of the puzzle shift, 
we can't shift too quickly uh, because otherwise it'll all fall apart, fall apart or at least our connection to it will. Um, the reimagining that we've been doing has been uh, along sort of three uh, axes, a physical one, a virtual one, and a programmatic one. The physical is the physical space of the library. The virtual is mainly the website, the, the library website through which our patrons interact with most of our services. And then the programmatic is what I've been involved in uh, most strongly, although I've participated in discussions of all three. Um, on the programmatic side, uh, the libraries have been instrumental in passing an, a Harvard-style opt-out open access policy uh, for scholarly articles produced by our faculty. This involved convincing people uh, via scholarly communication programming, uh, which included presentations about copyright, open access, scholarly publishing, digital humanities, all of them explicitly asking the same question, among other things. But the question is, how do you, which is you being mostly faculty and graduate students, why do you do what you do? What is the larger purpose of your work here? And almost inevitably, the answers involve the human condition and the dissemination of knowledge and uh, a greater understanding, working towards a greater understanding of ourselves and our world. We didn't have to say that that's inherently a social justice issue. At some point, that becomes clear. And um, I will come back to this point uh, later on in the presentation. So here are the beginnings of digital scholarship services. Uh, first, there was a larger reorganization starting with uh, bibliographic services. Um, we are, as a library, doing very different things than we did 30 years ago. Uh, we're doing a lot less physical processing, a lot more metadata. So the groups uh, within bibliographic services were sort of reshuffled, and some people are doing the same things, and some people are doing slightly different things. Um, uh, and uh, DISC was announced in uh, February of 2016 by my boss, Jack Ammerman, who is the Associate University Librarian for Digital Initiatives and Open Access. He said in his email, the new division recognizes the changing nature of scholarly investigation and the increasingly digital methods for research. It says nothing about social justice. It says nothing about any activist work. Uh, we were fully staffed a few months later in July of 2016, and our uh, department consists of myself, the digital scholarship librarian, of uh, a, a, an open BU, which is our institutional repository, and electronic theses and dissertations program librarian, that's all one person, uh, an open access specialist, and a metadata specialist. Um, we have some, we've been self-defining, right? But we have some parameters for our self-definition self uh, that we keep coming back to. Um, there's the question of audience. Whom do we serve and by whose mandate, right? Is it by the library's mandate or by the university's mandate? Um, and, and exactly, you know, are we serving undergrads? Are we serving graduate students? Uh, are we serving faculty? The answer is really all three, although we're focusing mostly on the faculty and graduate students for now. Um, and uh, in order to self-define, we've been listening to more experienced librarians talking about what the libraries should be doing in the current world, and I will talk about that later as well. So um, among the four of us, there are two new staff members, uh, the OpenBU librarian and the Open Access Specialist, Eleni Castro and Anna Newman. And we, when we were doing interviews for their positions, uh, with the two of them, as with some other folks, it, it became very clear that we had clear shared professional values. For example, open access as both a public good and a good for the researcher, uh, that despite being a library that serves a specific university community, national and international context is crucial, as is the local context uh, in terms of daily work. Um, that we're here fundamentally to connect with researchers, which requires different approaches in different fields, and collaborate with them. And here I will pause and give props to Alex Hill of Columbia University, uh, who 
has said in different venues, digital scholarship is not a service. Despite the, the name of our department, digital scholarship is, a, is fundamentally a collaboration and we should embrace it as such and uh, sort of both assert authority and offer the opportunity for scholars to, um, to meet us in a collaborative space and in a, in a collaborative way. We're all highly collaborative. That is definitely a shared professional value and we all value generosity in our coworkers. So here's what we did in our first year. It was a lot. At the end of it, I uh, wrote a report uh, for my bosses uh, outlining everything that we'd done. And I said, this was great and completely unsustainable and is probably not going to happen again unless resources change. So here's what we did. We established ourselves within the university very quickly from the provost's level on down. We've started a ton of conversations uh, via mostly via both workshops and, and some other events. Uh, we have a, a lot of programming for Open Access Week, which we have expanded into Open Access Month. Um, we've started discussion sessions. Uh, DISC is our abbreviation, so we're you know playing off of that, um, which are uh, sort of oriented toward ourselves and our fellow librarians and people interested in libraries and archives and issues that that arise in our work and also we have some uh, we have a series of digital scholarship fundamentals workshops uh, for which the inspiration uh, was uh, Micah Vandegrift's uh, group in Florida uh, and they were very generous speaking of generosity of co-workers in sharing uh, both sort of the, the workshop structure and the materials. In the first year, we also began pulling together university-wide resources. There's, there, there are many pockets within the university within which digital scholarship is supported in some ways. Um, within the, our Hariri Institute for Computational Thinking, there's sort of an agile development unit called SAIL, or Software Application and Innovation Lab. And not only are they excellent programmers, but they happen to know exactly how to talk to humanities and social sciences scholars, which is very rare and I'm very grateful and we've been trying to sort of figure out how to collaborate with them on, on supporting the researchers. Um, in our College of Arts and Sciences, there's definitely interest in setting up some infrastructure, but there's also its own IT department who have also been, been very helpful. Um, we have an entire division of the university under the provost, the associate provost for digital learning and innovation. And then there are some other smaller groups. And we've been trying to sort of, we, we've both been trying to, to bring all these groups together in conversation and participate in others uh, pulling together efforts. Let me, I just realized that my chat window is closed. So, hey, my slides are not up. Hmm. Can we pause and deal with that? Uh, I see your slides. They just haven't haven't changed. Have you been changing your slides? Uh, you should be seeing Boston University Libraries uh, front web page. No. Uh, we see just your first slide. Huh. Fascinating. That wasn't what happened before. Um, let me restart the presentation. Maybe that will help. Well, now we see the library site. Do you now see the digital it's scholarship a, services? Uh, no, it looks like the little, sur yes, yes. You underneath. do? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, the, the slides were not very uh, crucial. This, this was the context slide. Yeah, Ronald so points out too that it's you can if you just push slideshow and then from beginning that that'll just start it and you can um, navigate to the next with yeah, arrows. Right. Okay. So it's just so, the slideshow. Select slideshow and from beginning. I. That's what I did. Let's try that again. Sorry. Okay. Do you see Boston so. University Libraries webpage? The search box there? Yes. Yes. Do you now see the Digital Scholarship Services uh, logo underneath? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Moving on. Thank you. Okay. So, um, all right. So, so 
bringing together all these conversations is all part of BU's ongoing defragmenting. Um, what I mean by that is that for 25 years, uh, ending a while ago, we had a president who sort of delighted in fragmenting the university and uh, pitting people against each other. I don't know why, but there we are. And we're still dealing with that legacy. It's very real. The university consists of people. And so we have been, the various organizations within BU have been defragmenting in various ways. And um, you know, some of that has felt like corporate streamlining, but Mostly it has felt like a very good faith effort to become a more cohesive and uh, powerful organization that, that does what its values profess. So here's why we are initiating institution-wide conversations. First, we want to understand uh, who and how is already supporting digital scholarship uh, at BU. Um, BU libraries have not been as present as we would like in institute in institution-wide decision-making for largely historical reasons. And we think we have real contributions to make. And the way to show that is, or one way to show that is to start conversations. Um, we have to assume that support for digital scholarship will be, will remain distributed across the university. Um, and we want to create a true digital scholarship support infrastructure. Um, things like, when researchers need specific kinds of help, where do they go? When they need help but don't know what kind, what is their first stop? Um, when, when do we refer a scholar to one another, uh, to, to among our, our support units? What kind of technical infrastructure do we need? Uh, and what is missing from our human infrastructure and how do we feel, fill those needs? And where in the university should, should they be located? Also, you know, what kind of funding sources are available internally? How do we help our researchers apply for external funding? All of this as a whole is still unclear to us systemically and it's much more unclear to researchers. So now we're in the sort of conversation mode of, of trying to clarify that and, and get some commitments from the administration. Our direction has been driven in part by serendipity. We know some of what we want to do, but it is important for us to, to leave room to take advantage of opportunities, right? And people tend to frame this, frame this as, as flexibility, and it is that, but there's also a real element of leaving actual room in the schedule for serendipity to happen. And this felt risky in uh, our first year when we were proving ourselves, but we feel that it paid off. Um, so now I want to tell you about the beginnings of the Vulnerable Archives Project. Um, we really need to find a different name for it. This one feels paternalistic, but we're going to do that once it coalesces a little bit more. Here's how it all started. Ashley Farmer, who is a, a brilliant researcher, uh, historian new to BU, uh, she's been here for a year, came to us uh, last October uh, because she had just finished writing this book. Do you see the book? I hope you see the book. Um, no, the slide hasn't changed. Listen, I'm, I'm using the arrows <laughs> and everything. Yeah, I, I know you are. <laughs> it's just when you went to do show, now we see the book. When you went right. to do view slideshow, it, it got a little wonky looking too, so I don't, I don't really know what's going on. But I All can right. see the book. Can everyone else see the book? All right. I heard people in the office say yes, so. Okay. All right. Well, this is going to be fun times. Okay, so um, so so she wrote a book on black women in the black power movement, and to do that, she did she did a lot of research in people's personal archives, right? So she came to us originally to talk about third party copyright. What permissions do I need to get? What permissions don't I need to get? Where does fair use end? All that that sort of a conversation, and then we started talking about the research that she was actually doing and she was she said things like you know I went to people's houses in Alabama in rural Alabama where they have these boxes in their basements and one flood and all of that stuff is gone and we said oh my god that is terrifying from a librarian archivist standpoint um, simultaneously with this uh, the last federal election happened and that brought up lots of concerns for libraries. 
Um, I'm going to pause to say that no matter what your politics, there's stuff here that, it, that, that is to be concerned, that libraries are concerned about. Um, I, I take heart from people like Chris Borg uh, and Rupika Riesem and uh, April Hathcock who have all been saying again and again that nothing that we do as librarians is apolitical. Um, this is true of both libraries and my home field of uh, digital humanities. Um, and, and I think that libraries do hold real power and we started thinking about how to harness that power and how to, to actually do a thing that is real and meaningful and specific. Simultaneous, just after the election, simultaneously again with our, with our um, conversations with Ashley, um, we started having conversations with area librarians from between four and six other institutions about how, how can we amplify each other's work. Um, and we sort of had a few meetings and it was, we flailed about a little bit and then we said, wouldn't it be nice to, you know, in Boston in particular, where there are so many campuses, educational campuses, to document campus activism, which is a, a, a funny thing to, funny project to sort of start doing collaboratively because different institutions have different possibilities around that. Some institutions just don't want to talk about it. Some institutions really do. Um, so all of these things taken together, we at BU formulated a project. Here's the project. We want to find materials that document experiences of people that have been historically marginalized or otherwise mistreated by both society and the cultural heritage sector. And in particular, we'd like to find materials that your typical archive might not collect at all, or if it does collect them, might not make them readily available basically ephemera. What we, what we want to do with those materials, we don't want to take physical custody of them for longer than it takes to digitize them. We want to help digitize them and preserve their materials if their owners are willing, of course. Um, and we want to help make these materials publicly accessible to the extent that their owners allow that and that they think it's a good idea that does not harm any marginalized individuals. And we want to do all of this with an explicitly anti-colonialist mindset. Why frame it that way? Mostly because we're learning, looking to learn from past mistakes uh, that our fellow librarians and archivists have made and do better than we've done before. And I'll touch on that uh, again more in a few minutes. What does anti-colonialist mean here? Uh, we would like to counteract what in communication studies has long been called symbolic annihilation, which is the erasure of people's experiences through their underrepresentation in media. And we would like to do it by facilitating um, what Michelle Caswell and Marika Sifor and Mario Ramirez last year termed representational belonging. They use this term to, I quote, describe the ways in which community archives empower people marginalized by mainstream media outlets and memory institutions with the autonomy and authority to establish, enact, and reflect on their presence in ways that are complex, meaningful, substantive, and positive to them in a variety of symbolic contexts. Here's the trick. We are not a community archives. We are a private higher ed institution. Um, so, and I don't know if it's possible for us to truly contribute to increased representational belonging through collecting these materials and making them available as, as, as possible. But we do have resources that we would like to dedicate to this. Not many, but some. Um, and we have come up with some principles that, that we'd like to follow that we hope will at least avoid doing active damage, and I'll tell you about them shortly. And plus, we're in conversation with peer institutions who we think we have, have already been doing this work well locally, and in particular, um, Northeastern universities, libraries, and archives. So we're thinking hard precisely about how a library in our institutional position, as part of an institution that is a large employer locally, right, and a large landowner in the local community, how, ca how we can contribute to serving the community in this way. Um, there, we, there are existing projects uh, that 
serve as models for us in this. For example, Documenting the Now, uh, which is a, a collection of folks who make it easier for others to, to do ethical collection, use, and preservation of social media content, particularly as it relates to politically hot topics, uh, for example, police violence in the US. We don't want to duplicate their efforts, there's enough work to do, but they do serve as models for us in how to approach community-oriented projects. We're interested in the kinds of personal archives that Dr. Farmer has worked with, um, which are e either vulnerable to disappearance, right, one flood and this thing is gone, or vulnerable to obscurity, one of the archives that she was working with um, is a, is a personal collection of uh, Gwendolyn Patton, who was a leader in the Black Power Movement, and who ended up working for many years as an archivist at a community college in rural Alabama. Um, and she donated uh, her personal collection to the archives at that community college, and that's where it lives right now. In order to use it, you have to know that it exists. After you know that it exists, you still have to travel there, which is non-trivial because it's sort of in a rural place, um, and you have to have the resources to do so. Uh, so this archive, which is rich and important, is vulnerable in some sense to obscurity. So vulnerable archives project. What do we actually do? Well, we tried to start with Gwendolyn Patton, actually, mostly because Ashley had connected with her already and because we knew about the archive at that community college. Um, and we, Ashley emailed her and uh, she did not reply and we emailed her back and we didn't get a response and within a couple of months of that, she passed away, uh, which really brought home to us the time-sensitive nature of this work. Uh, you know, if we're gonna go as far back as to the beginnings of the Black Power Movement, those folks are not young. This is what, uh, I, I think this is partly what prompted the History Makers Archive, if you know that wonderful project. Um, so so we're, we're hoping to come back to this, but um, definitely later. So, so what then? Well, we decided to go local because we'd been having these conversations with, uh, with our local compatriots in libraries and archives, and we started asking what has it been like to be black in Boston over the last several very eventful decades of, you know, continued segregation, uh, the Boston school busing crisis that was an attempt to deal with the segregation and worked spectacularly in some ways and failed spectacularly in other ways, um, and the desegregation work that followed it and all of the sort of community relations uh, around that. Um, as I said, we've been meeting with local librarians and archivists uh, already doing similar work to learn from them, to learn how they approach this work and how they approach working with the, uh, with the people in the community outside of higher ed. And in particular, helpful has been Jordana Mekanyi, who is uh, Northeastern's head of archives. Here we go with another slide. You know what, let me just do this. I hope you can see this. So we started conversations with the BU uh, Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground. Um, they were established in 1986 uh, and they are, their job is to start difficult conversations. Uh, they are building community through events, formal and informal. Uh, they certainly have these difficult conversations uh, um, that they, uh, that they sort of both facilitate and invite outside speakers to. Um, they have lighter things like record listening parties with the Dean of Students who's really into jazz and that's been great. Uh, they, they're you know, fostering connections across campus, reaching out to undergrads a lot um, and they're welcoming to all and at the same time, they center people of color and other marginalized communities. So we started conversations with them and uh, we asked them, is there any way we can help you? Is there any way we can amplify your mes message? And in conversation, it, it came out that they had these folders full of, um, full of, uh, uh, 
flyers and uh, articles about them and um, sort of artifacts from the last, you know, 25 years that they've been, uh, or what, 35 years that they've been around, and also their publications that they want to digitize. So we're like, great, we can digitize those for you. We will work with you on metadata to enhance discoverability. We'll put them into our, um, our institutional repository. Um, and in those conversations, it also came out, they also said, oh, you should talk to, to a particular dean uh, around here. Um, and we, you know, we met with the dean and the director of uh, the Howard Thurman Center and told him about the project. And ultimately, he wants to help us take this forward, which is fantastic because he uh, has many connections to the, the African-American community in Boston and has for many years. And um, the main points of our meeting with this dean were, we want to do this right. We don't want to fail. And it will take some time and some very careful conversations to do this right, partly because my department are all white women. Uh, we have two immigrants among us, but that's not necessarily going to fly in terms of making the kinds of personal connections that encourage people to sort of open up about the things that make them and their communities vulnerable to further abuse, frankly. Um, so, so that's where the project stands at right now. Now, what do we do in the, in the meantime? Um, we uh, are gratefully following the cultural heritage workers of color who speak up on social media and elsewhere, um, who are frustrated with uh, the profession and their white colleagues. Um, we record their generalized advice and we create sort of a playbook for ourselves for both digital scholarship services in general and for this project in particular. And we continue reading and articulating what getting this right means. So what is getting this right and what is the socio-political context in which we do we're doing this work? Well, um, can somebody let me know whether you can see the principles here? Um, Yes, I, I see some principles, is what it says. Oh, goodness. Uh, well, this so, is going to be, you don't see the list of them. Yeah, I see the list. It, just, it says some principles. I was just, I was trying to make a joke. Sorry, I didn't go over. Okay. There's, Do you still see them? There's six. Yes, okay. there's six of them, right? Six feet. Okay, oh. yeah. All right. Okay. Moving on. So, so for us, placing our work in context started with publications and presentations by researchers who engage with Native American and other indigenous resources. And we're particularly influenced by Kimberly Kristen, who's behind the Mukutu content management system, which was created to serve the needs of indigenous uh, populations worldwide. And we're also influenced by Jane, Jane Anderson, who is a lawyer who writes about what ownership of knowledge means in different cultural contexts and how that influences archival work. So we've been reading more. And again, I don't know what shape our end product will take, right? We'll put some stuff in the repository, but the repository runs on DSpace and it doesn't have a very good front end. And the idea is that then there will be curated exhibits or collections that, that actually create narratives around those, those artifacts. Um, we're just starting to build this community within our libraries and to contribute to the larger one that's outside of them and outside of BU. But so the, these are some principles that you're seeing that we've articulated in part based on our engagement with the ongoing discourse. These are the tenets that are guiding our work. The first is, wherever and however we collect, disseminate, and preserve these materials, we want them to be alive to possibilities of rehistorization. rehistoricization. And this comes from multiple places, uh, but the wording is from a 2014 article by David J. Kim and Jacqueline Bournemont uh, that's called Performing Archive, Identity, Participation, and Responsibility in the Ethnic Archive. Um, they uh, describe a project called um, React Feminism and their v online video archive that is self-described as a living archive, emphasizing the use, appropriation, and reinterpretation of documents. And Kim and Wernemont call that the raison d'etre of a web-based archive. So that's what we're aiming for. Uh, number two is that we're not here to empower people. 
Um, this is an important undercurrent of why we feel entitled to do this work in the first place. Um, we are here to offer infrastructure that can uh, that we think can amplify other people's voices and, and, and some expertise to go along with it. The power, however, is theirs, and we take that cue from DeRay McKesson, who is an activist and one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, he has a podcast called Pod Save the People, and um, on a recent episode titled We Don't Know How This Movie Ends, um, he says, one of the ways that oppression works is that it tries to convince you that you don't have power. And I've been, he says, in a lot of spaces, uh, and people use this language of empowerment, like I'm going to empower you, and I'm going to empower that person, empower this group of people. And what I remind myself of all the time is you can't give people power. Um, he says that's just not how this works. What you can do as an organizer is to help people remember the power that they already have, and you can help them unlock that power. Um, he says, we're always fighting to make sure structures and systems recognize the power that people should have over their lives and give that at, at the structural level and give that to them. And that is what we think about, again, he says, when we think about empowerment. So that's our second tenet. The third one is, for each artifact, address ownership. Jane Anderson, um, who wrote an article called Colonial Archives and Copyright Law in 2009, points out that there are multiple relationships of ownership with an archive. There will always be an author. There might be a different owner as well. And the archive itself will have certain ownership rights. But, rights. but in almost all contexts, she says, the people who are depicted or represented in photographs, sound recordings, films, have no rights of ownerships as they are neither authors or artists nor owners of the property. And that gets really problematic. And we want to be conscious of that and avoid that as much as we can. Number four is tell all the truth that will not put marginalized people in danger. And here we've been reading Jarrett Drake, uh, an archivist who has recently left the archival profession in frustration uh, and went on to graduate school in anthropology. Uh, but he did a, a conference presentation earlier this year in British Columbia titled, How Libraries Can Trump the Trend to Make America Hate Again. And here he does not mince words. Here's what he says. Libraries should be on the front lines to fight fascism because the control of information and ideas is central to the spread of fascism. And thus, libraries will be forced to either endorse that spread or encumber it. As such, libraries can play their part to squash the spread of fascism if they decide to assert authority, center communities, and never normalize. And yet, Drake is conscious of the harm that can be done by the spread of information, and he presents a difficult parallel between one of our key responsibilities, which he says is directly supporting citizen anonymity and obfuscation when necessary, and another, which is preserving local languages, taxonomies, and other forms of knowledge that only people within specific communities uh, can decipher, because it might well be a form of resistance in a country where, the, where a president not only advocates for a Muslim database, but also for a lot of systems beyond databases. So uh, we don't know what, how that will manifest in our work, because that'll depend on, on, the, on, on what uh, artifacts we find. But uh, we're very conscious of, of not making information available that will harm people. Number five is make a conscious effort toward ethical open access. Um, and this, again, goes back to what Drake was talking about. And Kristen, uh, who calls for an expansive, expansive definitions of open access, which not only accommodate cultural exigencies, uh, which are very present in the indigenous communities that she works with, but seed control in a real way to the communities represented by, prim by the primary materials. And in this project, we're in a funny position of being the authority on issues like preservation, but wanting to seed control. Um, so we'll need to drive the topics of conversations, but, but, but get real input and, in some sense, directives from material owners. And striking this balance is a matter of conscious effort, hence number five. Um, number six is, with every action, explicitly serve the communities represented. Never appeal to a selfless noble ideal. Um, Jane Anderson and her collaborator, Kathy Bowery, in 2009, um, said that for many indigenous people across the globe, there's no fuzzy warm glow that automatically 
accompanies Western, Western words like humanity, culture, progress, freedom, openness, and knowledge. And for us, that translates to what is the good being created for the people represented in the art article, uh, in the artifacts. In other words, how are we serving them? And how we intend to do that is always collaborate on descriptive metadata with them um, and let them tell their own story. Um, so I have things to tell you about how this circles back to fit into the larger institutional con uh, contexts that I'm going to fly through because we are running out of time. Our African American Studies program is getting a facelift with a new chair. Um, the, the university uh, social justice work has a long history and uh, we have both made sort of recent statements on political matters on, at the university president's level and also um, BU uh, the various schools and colleges at BU um, ha include social justice explicitly into their values and educational statements. So this is not without context. And both we and the university are taking a new look at libraries and thinking about their future. And partly this is prompted by the recently announced retirement of our institutional or, or university librarian. But it's not only that. Even before the retirement was announced, um, We've, you know, the BU Center for the Humanities has been putting together a conference on libraries and archives in the digital age that is happening next week. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, in thinking about the future of libraries at BU, we've been looking out to other libraries and in particular, of course, to MIT libraries, both uh, their future of libraries report and the um, statement of mission, vision, and values that they've just put out, I think, two days ago. Um, so that's the larger institutional context. We've encountered obstacles like, for example, Gwen Patton's death and the usual staffing issues and a lack of explicit institutional mandate in this. Um, but we're, um, we're taking that as an opportunity, I guess. Uh, so to wrap up, why have I told you all this? It is a story of a nascent project with no delivered results as yet uh, that may or may not amount to anything, although we very much hope that it does. This isn't a standalone project, though. This is the beginning of a process. Because part of wanting to do this right um, is our intention to do it in the open and to invite feedback more or less continuously. And, you know, if you're just starting out on this kind of project, too, that can be scary or lonely or both. And we want to talk to you if you want to talk to us. And if we're all going to make mistakes, we might as well make them once and learn from each other. So now. Do you have any thoughts or reactions, or are you running away screaming? Thank you. Thank you, Vika. Do we have any questions for Vika? I have a question here from Anna. It says, how do minority languages affect their preservation and cataloging efforts? Oh, goodness. It's not just minority languages. It's in our library, honestly, it's majority languages. It, we don't have, we have a huge backlog on um, many African languages, uh, African language materials, and um, the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean uh, records because we don't have people who can really engage with those languages employed full time at, uh, at the library. Um, outside of my department, the libraries have created this internship program uh, with our African Studies uh, Center and the African Studies program where students can uh, work with us on metadata for uh, African language records. And we have several taught here. We are, we're very strong in African languages. Uh, so that has just started and I don't actually know how it's going, but uh, people seem to be excited about it. So um, I know that we have at least one student uh, who is who is basically just going through metadata records and updating them for us and telling us what they say. And that's really exciting. Uh, but it's a huge it's a huge problem and I think that uh, uh, speaking of building communities, libraries have to, to share that sort of resource and I hope that once we establish the, this internship with the African languages more solidly, we can share that out uh, to other libraries and have them share back uh, maybe expertise in other languages. Does that answer the question? She says it does, yes. Great. Do we have any other questions for Vika today? 
Uh, I just want to say that it was a really informative presentation, and I, I enjoyed it. And look, Dean has a question here. One second. Dean says, the standard goal is mo in most archives involves the preservation of records of minority populations and organizations, has been to create a position, provide support for training, and establish a profession a professional as a contact. Do you intend to do that? Do you need me to read um, that again? No, no, I, I, I got it. Uh, me personally, I, uh, so here's my, here's my situation. I have no budget. Uh, none of us have a budget. Uh, it's all sort of under a single person who, and, and it's, and it's sort of a black box and that may change in the future, but that's our situation now. I have, I can request staffing. Um, but BU is very, very slow about staffing. Um, so we're certainly not going to try to do that before we try to do any real work because that's just not going to, it's going to be a non-starter. Would I very much like to do that? Yeah, of course. Um, and I would also very much like to work with um, uh, the, Ar the Howard Gottlieb archive here at BU, which is not the university archives, but, uh, but, is, but is a very robust archives uh, of, of outside materials. Um, and I would like to, I would love to work with them on this, uh, and and we're trying to to find a, a way to collaborate. But staffing issues are are huge, and in this situation, in this institution in particular, it is so big, and so many things are changing right now that uh, all change is happening very in very small increments. Dean adds to that that. He thinks another good solution is what he calls angels in the community, individuals mm -hmm. who handle contacts and liaisons for us yep. on a volunteer basis. They, ha yeah. they say they have some as well who do that. Well, that's, that's what we're hoping to that's, – that's how we're hoping to work with the community. Thank you, Dean, for your questions and your, your you. feedback. Yeah.